Anyway, so I thought I'd, I'd start by just making a few quick comments about the Canadian Peace Congress, the, the group that, uh, that I'm here uh, speaking for. Um, that was, it was formed in 1949 in the aftermath of the struggle against fascism and war in, in Spain and, and World War II. And it was an effort to, <clears throat> to unite Canadian people uh, for disarmament and for peace and to oppose uh, uh, imperialism, and militarism and, and war. And through that same time, since 1949, the Canadian Peace Congress has been members of the World Peace Council. And that group is currently headquartered in Athens, Greece. And um, it's, uh, it's the, I, I think it's the largest um, international peace organization. I'm not positive of that, but I think it is. It has about 90, more or less 90 member organizations um, from every continent except for Antarctica. So... Um, and they have regular meetings, and, and I represent Canada on the executive committee of, of that body. So um, now our our work as the Canadian Peace Congress is rooted in an anti-imperialist analysis. Now, this tour is part of a priority campaign that we have uh, around NATO, and it links with a World Peace Council yeah World Peace Council campaign. It's called Yes to Peace, No to NATO. That's been a world campaign that they've had for a number of years now. But I, I think it's important to note right from the beginning that our, um, the way that we uh, designed our campaign and the way that we've uh, positioned our, our understanding of NATO is really, it's certainly informed by the international aspect, but uh, international movement aspect, but it's mostly informed by our analysis of the dynamics of, of peace and, and war and militarism in Canada as Canadian peace activists. It's, it's sort of a homegrown campaign, if you will, that connects with other organizations. Um, through this, we have other campaigns as well, and I can mention them later if, if people are interested. But through this campaign, what we're hoping to do primarily is to increase the level of awareness and discussion in Canada about NATO and what it means to be a member of NATO and, and uh, what the impact of NATO membership is, and also to, to, um, to strengthen and build a campaign of Canadian people calling for Canada's withdrawal from NATO and instead an independent foreign policy based on peace, international cooperation, and solidarity. So I've got a couple of campaign materials here that I brought, and <clears throat> I'll pass them around later, but so we've got some postcards here that uh, call for Canada to withdraw from NATO. And I have these little fabric doves, which, um, it's a bit cheesy, but <clears throat> this banner is, uh, as you can tell, it's an elongated map of Canada, and everywhere that I've visited, We've um, asked people to write, you know, a name or, or, you don't have to use your name, or a peace message or where they are, or something like that. And then we stick the little doves on here and it makes a nice visual representation of the broad basis for a new foreign policy for Canada. And when, at some point, both with the postcards and with the banner, we're uh, planning to have some discussions with uh, parliamentarians, we'll see how that goes and take along some of this material. And the other thing that I brought along was a sign-up sheet. And the reason that that's important is, <clears throat> you know, as we're building a campaign, we've got we to gotta stay in touch and we've got to engage one another, not just have a, a one-way flow of information, but have a real um, dynamic discussion around these issues. Um, now, when we talk about NATO, <clears throat> uh, I think it's important to note that within the broad peace movement, the broadest possible understanding of the peace movement and peace supporting movements, this discussion on NATO membership has, has risen and subsided over time, right? And it takes different tacks. And I think that we can see that there's three general arguments or, or positions that, <clears throat> that are represented within the, the peace and, and progressive movements. And um, so the first position is, is this, that in the post-Cold War era, NATO is being reformed. It's transforming from a military alliance with a defined geopolitical region and into an institution of global security that is allied with the United Nations. And in, the, in that model, NATO provides, or is seen to provide, a necessary, the necessary resources for humanitarian intervention in the defense of international law. And peace groups, or, or groups that have this kind of focus, they, their work tends to be oriented towards strengthening the integration of NATO in the United Nations and hastening this process of transformation. So that's one uh, proposal, generally speaking, that comes up. Another one is that NATO is an institution whose, um, whose raison d'etre, whether or not it was ever legitimate, is not the question. The point is that now 
it's, it's over. The Cold War is finished. Uh, <clears throat> we don't have um, uh, the, the situation that led to NATO is gone. It's a cumbersome organization. It's costly. It's unfocused. It's discredited. It needs to be dissolved. But it needs to be, the, the argument here is that it needs to be resolved through the agreement of its member groups, or of its member nations, I mean, member, member states. And peace groups that have that focus tend to not call for Canada to get out of NATO, but rather <clears throat> encourage the Canadian government to make moral and pragmatic arguments within NATO that the alliance needs to be dissolved. And then there's a third general uh, proposal around NATO, and that's that NATO is an aggressive institution pursuing a specific objective, and that its activities and policies have always been a threat to world peace, and they continue to be. Um, also, that NATO has a profound effect on its member states by distorting and weakening sovereignty and democracy. It's not an organization that can be reformed. It's not an organization that can be dissolved voluntarily, and it must be dismantled piece by piece. <clears throat> and the focus of, of groups that have that position, and you're probably picking up that that's a position of the Canadian Peace Congress, the focus of groups with this position is to pressure member states to withdraw, and what that does is increasingly weaken the organization, but at the same time advance the, um, uh, the it strengthens the alternative for sovereignty and independent foreign policies. So now, those three positions that I just talked about, those are generalizations, right? And there's, <clears throat> um, there's lots of interplay at different times between groups that have those different positions, but I think it's a, it's a pretty truthful um, uh, description of the main currents in discussions around NATO. And I think the first thing we have to do is consider what they are and decide which which one best informs the way forward. So with respect to the first proposal, which is that NATO is being reformed into a credible and important institution of global security, um, the first argument against this is actually that, that NATO, by, by virtue of being a military alliance, is there's a strong argument that it's actually counter to international law, it's very foundation. And um, the, the UN Charter, and I can't remember what article it is, 51 maybe, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, the UN Charter talks about legitimacy of regional military alliances, but I, I think even from its foundation, <clears throat> when NATO was based on uh, Canada, United States, and, and Western Europe, that's an enormously huge region of the world, and it's not realistically a region that ever gets identified anywhere else in world discussions, except with respect to NATO. So I think it's pushing the envelope a little bit to claim that it's a regional, um, a, a regional military alliance and therefore justifiable under, under the UN uh, Charter. But um, this isn't the argument that I want to dwell upon for a couple reasons. One is that I'm not an international lawyer, international uh, legal uh, professor or anything like that and there's other people who are better equipped to have that discussion, but also I think there's stronger arguments against this proposal that NATO is becoming a credible and important institution of international law. Um, when we talk about the UN, it's, it's very true that there are lots of problems with the United Nations, and probably we could, you know, if we paused and, and pulled that down and I wrote on it, and we had a big brainstorm of, of what the problems of the UN are, we'd probably fill that, that, uh, that screen with writing. But, you know, it's been co-opted, it's been distorted, it's been weakened. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that the UN is still the main institution of international law in the world. And, <clears throat> by and large, it's the most democratic institution of international law in the world. And what I mean by that is that its treaties are discussed and amended mostly through a public process. Um, it, its treaties and its, its covenants and its conventions are, are translated into many languages and made available to people all over the world. And in terms of its uh, composition, the UN is largely representative of the states of the world, not, not the peoples of the world and the nations of the world, but the states of the world, who um, in, the, in that countries have a seat and a voice and a vote at the UN General Assembly. The Security Council, of course, is another, you know, is a, is another uh, problematic question all unto itself. And if we, tra if we contrast this with NATO, we see that NATO, we do see some contrasts, and they're important. NATO is not an open organization. It's not an open membership. Its key decisions are confidential. Its membership is not at all representative of the world states, and its foundation is arguably not even consistent with international law. 
So then the question becomes, on whose terms is NATO deepening its involvement with the United Nations? And we could ask, is NATO becoming more open and more transparent? Is it amending its treaty uh, and its policies so that they're consistent with the, with the UN Charter of Human Rights or the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights or the Covenant on Political and Civil Rights or the Convention Against Torture, any of these, you know, no, it's not. Um, on the other hand, we, should, we could also ask, is it the UN that's being reformed and distorted through its association with NATO? Is the UN pressing for diplomatic and political solutions to international crises, or is it rubber stamping acts of war and aggression in the name of humanitarian intervention? And is it outsourcing command of these missions to NATO? Is the UN respecting human rights and the sovereignty of states, or is it providing moral and political cover under phrases like responsibility to protect to selective interventions that serve the strategic interests of the United Nations, or sorry, the United States and Western Europe? Is the UN defending the rights of peoples to choose their own path of social and political and economic development, or is it turning a blind eye while entire societies are forcibly reoriented towards the economic interests of the US and Western Europe? So these are important questions, and the point is not to blindly support the United Nations or to, to overlook the problems of the UN. That, that is an important question. Um, but it, it's rather the point is to suggest that through its deepening association with NATO, the strengths of the United Nations are being diminished and marginalized, and its weaknesses are being compounded and, and uh, ac accelerated. And NATO is not reforming into an instrument of international law. Uh, I would argue that it's using the UN as a fig leaf to obscure its real role in the world. So that's the sort of a discussion of the first proposal. And the second proposal, which is that NATO needs to be dissolved voluntarily by its members. Um, on the one hand, of course, I would agree with, yes, I mean, I'd love to wake up and read the morning paper and see NATO's dissolved. That'd be great. But there's some, um, I don't think this is the best approach to take, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, NATO is not an or open organization. It selects its members uh, very carefully. And those members have political, military, and financial obligations to the organization. Um, not too many people know this, but Canada's dues, each country pays dues to NATO before they even get to having to pay for the different wars that, that they, uh, uh, and interventions that NATO does. They have to pay dues. And Canada's dues each year are between 200 and $250 million. So you figure, okay, 200 million bucks isn't a lot in the grand scheme of a federal budget, but then you figure well, over four years, you're looking at about a billion dollars. And there's a number of social programs that could be paid for with a billion dollars over four years. Here we are at university campus, um, <clears throat> dropping tuition fees would be, you know, there's, uh, that's a, a big, big chunk of money that could be used to drop tuition fees. Um, Anti-poverty, housing, uh, anti-violence program, I mean, name it. Right? I mean, think of every cut that the Harris, or, sorry, the, the Harper government has brought in. All those cuts, you know, you just find a list of those and you can take that $250 million a year and you could allocate that money to a lot of those. And that is just the entry fee, right? That's just to get in the door at NATO. Other obligations are Article 5, which is in the NATO Charter, and maybe people know this, it's, it's uh, usually called the Mutual Clause, and what that means is that if an individual member of NATO is attacked, everybody has to respond, like the Three Musketeers. Um, this, this clause has actually only been used once, and that was in the case of Afghanistan in 2001, <clears throat> which is sort of bizarre, actually, and that was used to, um, to really strongly uh, just to strong arm NATO members into supporting what was presented as a multinational effort to go into Afghanistan. But, so the point is though that these obligations, and there are others, will stay in force even if Canada goes to the table at NATO and says we have to dissolve. There's, we're still going to send $250 million a year out of public money. We're still going to be subject to the mutual clause. We're still going to be dragged into all these, all these different efforts that they do. So I don't think it's the strongest proposal to say, let's stay there and dissolve it voluntarily. And that brings me to the third question, which is that Canada should just simply withdraw. Now, here, it's important to think about what is NATO. Obviously, obviously, it's a military alliance. I think we're all aware of that. Um, but what isn't as clear <clears throat> or as apparent is that it's also an important, uh, 
it's also a political institution. And it has specific economic underpinnings to its politics. So alongside the military command structure at NATO, there's this um, structure called the Parliamentary Assembly. And that Parliamentary Assembly, or PA, provides an ongoing political exchange between NATO and the legislators in its member countries. Um, it's, the Parliamentary Assembly is very, very explicitly oriented towards government policy in those different countries, and it works very hard to ensure that legislation and programs are both consistent with NATO policy and facilitate um, the development of other NATO policies, or the implementation, rather, of other NATO policies. Now, I think <clears throat> that it's here in this Parliamentary Assembly that the impact of NATO membership is most squarely felt by, its, by countries like Canada. Um, it meets quite frequently, quite regularly. It uses a variety of different forums, and they pub the published reports, which are available on the internet, reveal that there's a very comprehensive prescription for everything from foreign policy to military policy to economic policy for its members. Uh, I'll pause and just let you know that in terms of uh, which Canadian parliamentarians are involved with the Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, it's almost every one of them. <clears throat> because what happens is they rotate each year. They have, I think it's called the NATO Parliamentary Assembly Committee. And the composition of that committee in, in Canada it changes from year to year. And again, you can go on the government website and you see a list of them. And there's representatives from every single party who are on there. And they just, so what it means is that every member of parliament is exposed to this intense lobbying effort from NATO and its, its agents. Um, and, and it's really difficult for people to get away from that. So the other thing that I want to make clear is that I'm not trying to suggest that NATO is uh, some kind of super state government that just pulls little puppet strings and its member states act according to its whims. Uh, I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's uh, the situation. But it also is um, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit of a hopeless situation if that's the case, right? I mean, we, there is still a role for the Canadian government and the, Canadians, uh, the Canadian people with, uh, lining up alongside their government to force some different orientations. So it's not a super state government, but what it is is it's a very, very powerful vehicle that NATO uses to draft policy and promote policy implementation in those sovereign states, or what we would call sovereign states. And there are some powerful forces within Canada who support those NATO policies, and the Canadian government, of course, is a willing participant in those. Uh, so we have some uh, challenges. And I, I thought it would be helpful to give some examples of political and economic policies in Canada that have been framed, at least in part, according to the pressures of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. So one is national missile defense. And this is, you know, back in the early 2000s, we had lots of debate in Canada about um, uh, the question of, of Canada joining ballistic missile defense from the, United, the Star Wars scheme in the United States. There was a lot of lobbying of the Canadian government. The Canadian government was very, very interested in, in uh, joining, and there were a lot of uh, corporations who were really interested in being a part of that. And uh, there was also, though, a lot of public opposition, and there was a lot of mobilization. There was um, uh, coalitions were formed, lobby efforts. Uh, there was a lot going on. And what happened was that in 2005, I think, there was a, a poll which showed that 52% of the Canadian population opposed having the country join U.S. missile defense, Star Wars. And that's really something when you figure um, all the resources that went into massaging public opinion and justifying missile defense and saying, oh, it's not aggressive, it's, it's defensive, it's not this, it's not that, it, you know, it's so necessary. And yet still, 52% of the population didn't uh, want the country to be involved with it. So, in response to this, the government announced that they wouldn't participate in missile defense. Now, that was an important victory. That's not the full story, of course. There, <clears throat> the government did other things. But for the purpose of this presentation, what's important is that right at the same time, NATO announced that they were going to build um, a theater missile defense, TMD, and it was virtually the same, a carbon copy of the scheme that uh, the United States had been pushing as NMD. 
And it was, um, you know, when NATO, uh, the, the problem of, of national missile defense from the point of view of the government and the military was that it was being discussed publicly and the public was weighing in on it. Whoops. So they figured out another vehicle. They, they, well, they actually figured out a couple of other vehicles. And one of them was NATO, who doesn't have to present its views to the public at all. Um, and so this is interesting is, oh, well, Canada has pledged its support for NATO's theater missile defense, including financial support, although I don't know how much that is. I wasn't able to find that figure. But what's interesting is there was a, an article in a Department of National Defense journal, um, and I don't know the title. I'll try and find it that stated that the NATO takeover of missile defense was a way to deal with the lack of public consensus on the issue. And so it just flies absolutely in the face of democracy, especially when you figure there was all of that public education, all of that public mobilization. We're going to go another way. Um, here's another issue that um, uh, uh, economic and military and political issue that's framed and, and guided somewhat by NATO, and that's the issue of nuclear weapons. And there's, there's two aspects to this that I wanted to mention to you. So the first is, obviously most Canadians tend to think of the country as being a non-nuclear weapons state. We don't own nuclear weapons, we don't test nuclear weapons, we haven't used them. Um, and most Canadians support disarmament and non-proliferation, and that's common among, I think, most of the world's people, support disarmament and non-proliferation. But it's important also to know that NATO maintains a first strike position, which means that uh, it view, first of all, NATO has nuclear weaponry, and second, they have this first strike position, which means that they withhold the right to cast the first stone. You know, <laughs> they they aren't going to use them just in defensive situations. They will use it in an offensive uh, capacity. And Canada is uh, a member of NATO's nuclear planning group. That's the organization or the committee that's responsible for developing and implementing and maintaining NATO's nuclear weapons policy. So by virtue of being a member of NATO, by virtue of being on the nuclear planning group, uh, I think <coughs> there's a pretty strong case to be made that Canada or any other country is de facto a nuclear weapons country. They have it, they have access to it, and they have a plan for using it. So we have a that's a that's a first problem and it's pretty serious the second problem <coughs> is um a little creepier <laughs> i think it's a and it's wrapped up with the f-35 fighter program and i know the f-35 is kind of off the table at least for the time being because of um at least formally that formal plan and purchase are somewhat off the table but um <coughs> What's important about that F-35? So that started out as what's called the Joint Strike Fighter Program, I think in 1997. And it was really a way for the United States to get internationalized funding to develop a new fighter plane, right? The U.S. military budget is absolutely massive. And um, they're always trying to find these ways to internationalize those costs. NATO is one effort, the Joint Strike Fighter is another effort, and there's others. So eventually, you know, the contract gets awarded to Lockheed Martin, and then <clears throat> they start to develop what we now know as the F-35. And then Canada in, uh, when was it, 2010, I think it was, uh, indicated that it would purchase uh, 65 of them through an untendered purchase, right, so through a secret deal, basically. And, of course, uh, public pressure and political pressure mounted, and it was focused mostly on the cost overruns and on, on a corrupt process. And those, that's important, right? It's really important that people focused on that and they exposed it and they challenged it. But there's another aspect to the F-35 which is, uh, I think, less known. Well, I know it's less known. And I think this will come back. <clears throat> I don't think this part is off the table. And that came up in 2010. So in 2000, May 2010, the n Nuclear uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty Review met in, uh, in New York. And the month before, in April 2010, the Obama government came up with what they called a Nuclear Posture Review, or NPR. And in that, there was a lot of press around a lot of what was in there because they kept talking about uh, stockpile reductions. We don't see the need for these big warhead stockpiles anymore. We're going to reduce them. We're committed to this. We're committed to that. And, you know, those, those are good things. Get rid of the nuclear warheads, stockpiles, for sure. But 
What was buried in there was a reference to the F-35, <clears throat> and it said, I'm going to paraphrase, but it said that um, the F-35 is going to be retooled. This is 2010, <clears throat> right? There's already been the international procurement process, and all these orders are coming in. They said it's going to be retooled so that it can be dual capable. I don't know what that means, so I looked it up. It means that it can carry a nuclear weapon. And then they said, and alongside the, re uh, the development of the F-35, we will redesign the B-61. Again, I don't know what a B-61 is, so I looked it up. It's a nuclear bomb. <clears throat> and so what's happening is, and then you find that these references increasingly. So what the, the process is to develop the F-35 into a nuclear-capable jet, this was only decided less than three years ago, and to develop a nuclear bomb that it can carry. So I couldn't find any evidence that countries who are putting in orders for F-35s have an option of buying a non-dual capable F-35. I think they, there's one that's being developed. It's nuclear capable. And I didn't find any evidence that the Canadian government had said, we'll take the plane, but thanks, but no thanks on the bomb. No. So the scary thing here is that it, there's two problems. <clears throat> One is that it takes the discussion about nuclear weapons and turns it into, these are really just conventional weapons. You know, tacti we used to call them tactical nuclear weapons when I was in high school. Because they're safe and they are discreet and they don't blow up cities. They just blow up a little tank and, and you know, there's... Yeah, it, it just sounds so nice and tidy. Um, in fact, the discourse needs to talk about them as nuclear weapons. I mean, <laughs> come on. The other thing, though, <clears throat> is that by making them, by developing them into this uh, F-35 program, it gives NATO and the U.S. a multinational delivery system, right? And then when you add drone aircraft onto that, then you get a multinational, unpersoned, unpiloted delivery system, which is kind of even weirder. So we have this problem with the F-35, and, and the fact is that in 2010, the F-35 procurement w began to appear, actually a little bit before 2010, began to appear on NATO Parliamentary Assembly agendas and minutes, and they were talking about it with concern. They were worried that the procurement process wasn't going far enough and fast enough, that the internationalization of the costs weren't coming in, and that there, and I, I suspect that they were also concerned that there wasn't going to be this delivery system that they could, you know, use as a network for um, carrying out specific military objectives, including the B-61 nuclear bomb. So even though the F-35 formally purchase plan is off the table, at least for the time being, A, it's probably going to come back on the table, and B, we need to keep our eye on how it comes back on the table and, and be talking about that. So. That's, um, that's the F-35. The two other areas <clears throat> that I'll mention about uh, policy, and these are more about domestic policy, that are informed very strongly by the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, uh, are the Arctic and energy or oil. So the Arctic, well, NATO has for years and years and years been very preoccupied with the Arctic because <clears throat> it's... Um, that allows them to border Russia, you know, um, in a close way and encircle Russia. They're always concerned about Russia and what Russia's doing, even though there have been some, they have joint meetings, they're always very preoccupied with, uh, with Russia. And as the ice caps melt and open up, it opens up opportunities for both a Russian military presence, naval presence in the Arctic, as well as a NATO or, or anybody else's naval presence. So. On, on the side of Canada, well, on the side of NATO, they're very interested in getting in there and militarizing it. And they're <clears throat> doing this, they're having this ongoing discussion, and they're trying and trying to pull non-NATO countries into this process, like uh, Finland and Sweden, for example, pull them in to the NATO fold by militarizing the Arctic against the threat of the Russians yet again. Um, from the Canadian side, the Canadian government side, there's... Um, it seems like every time there's a, a conservative majority, they talk about militarizing the Arctic, and they do it with, they run the flag up and make it look like it's nationalist, you know, and, and we should all be proud of doing this because it'll keep the Americans from running a submarine under the ice caps, or it'll, it'll keep, you know, whatever. I mean, in this case, it's about um, access to resources that lie uh, underneath the waters. 
And so <clears throat> um, the, the, the sad thing that's happening here is, is under the logic that's presented by NATO Parliamentary Assembly and other related interests, the, the debate really isn't whether or not we're going to militarize the Arctic. The debate is, is it going to be militarized by Canada or is it going to be militarized by a multinational force? We should be talking about, well, environmental security, the rights of Aboriginal people who live in the Arctic, you know, um, <clears throat> all, I mean, security itself, I mean, whether or not, we, we should talk about an Arctic zone of peace. And this is a campaign that the Canadian Peace Congress is working on with our international partners uh, in the circumpolar countries through the World Peace Council, so it's sort of interesting. But we aren't having that debate. Why? It's because public opinion is, has been guided by these other interests. So the last example I wanted to give you about um, <coughs> um, uh, policies that are, are guided by NATO interests is energy, and specifically oil. So what, I don't know how many people know this, but the United States military is the single largest purchaser and consumer of oil in the entire world. Um, it uses about 360,000 barrels of oil a day, and that's the same consumption, because I don't know, you know, I don't know what that means, so I looked it up. It, Ireland uses about 360,000 barrels of oil a day, and the Philippines uses 360,000 barrels of oil a day. So Philippines is a, got a, I can't remember what the population of the Philippines is, but it's a lot bigger than the population of, uh, of the U.S. military. And Ireland is, you know, a smaller population than the Philippines, but it's, it's an industrialized economy as well. So recently, the U.S. Department of Defense and NATO Parliamentary Assembly identified energy resources for the military as a strategic issue. That's the word they use, strategic issue. And it began to appear on agendas and reports and minutes. And in 2007, there was this interesting, interesting discussion among some notable U.S. politicians about making energy resources um, uh, relating access to energy resources to NATO's mutual clause that presumably if somehow access to oil for the US military were blocked this would trigger multinational or multi yeah multinational uh, aggression from the NATO countries um, that wasn't determined, but that discussion still continues. They, they've had recent discussions uh, since 2007 about that. Now, at the time that they were talking about this, the countries with the three largest oil reserves or known oil reserves were Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Canada. Now, I think Venezuela is at the top of the list because of the Orinoco um, uh, field. But um, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Canada at the time of 2007. And I think probably we're all clear or we're all aware <clears throat> of the, um, the draw that oil has as a pretext for war in the Middle East with Iraq and uh, Iran, Libya, Syria and all these places. There's certainly Afghanistan, there's certainly a, you know, oil and energy is always, well I was going to say in the background, but it's like <laughs> this far in the background, right? It occupies the entire background almost. But what's interesting here is that from the point of view of domestic policy in Canada, the Canadian government's approach to oil and energy is entirely consistent with that foreign policy. Why? Well, what's the foreign policy? Well, it's basically that if a country advocates a, a nationalist policy towards oil, you know, we'll take it over, we'll own it publicly, and we'll use it according to the interests of this government or the people, they're punished. They're punished. I mean, uh, Iraq, um, uh, Libya, uh, I won't say Afghanistan, it was a different situation, but um, uh, Syria, Iran, these are countries that have, or had in, in other cases, nationalist approaches to their energy policies, or quasi-nationalist approaches. And they were in Venezuela <clears throat> now, and what's the Canadian government been saying about Venezuela? They're floating a balloon with Jim Karajanis, a Toronto a member of parliament from the Liberal Party, who's really pushing this issue that Canada should get tough on Venezuela because there's not enough democracy there. But you have to ask, is this not informed, at least in part, by um, oil interests and Canadian corporate oil interests and U.S. Uh, Department of Defense energy interests in Venezuela? <clears throat> 
So, but that's the foreign policy side. You want to keep your oil away from us? You're going to get it. You're going to get invaded. You're going to get bombed, whatever. On the domestic side, <clears throat> what's Canada's energy policy? Well, in a nut, or what's their oil policy? Well, in a nutshell, it's get the stuff out of the ground and ship the raw bitumen south to the United States. And there's opposition to that policy, right? There's opposition to the pipelines. There's opposition from, well, there's opposition to the tar sands, for starters, from, from environmentalists and Aboriginal people and a whole lot of other people who care. There's opposition to the pipeline for similar reasons. Um, <clears throat> and what was the response of the Harper government? And I think it was about a year and a half ago. They responded by, there was a report in the newspaper and it said the military had been spying on Aboriginal and environmental groups who were opposed to the Gateway and Keystone pipelines. And Harper called them terrorists. Now that's not, and that's a pretty serious charge in, in the current era, you know? I mean, it's not like a dismissive thing. You call someone a terrorist in the, in the era of homeland security and the anti-terrorist legislation, that's a pretty serious threat on someone. And you send the military in to spy on them, my God. So what I'm arguing is that these policies are very, very consistent domestically and from a foreign policy point of view. Um, the, I'm almost finished here, but I want to say that there are powerful economic and social forces in Canada who have an interest in NATO membership. And uh, among them are uh, Resource corporations, military industries and organizations, the financial sector, right-wing politicians and parties, right-wing think tanks, and of course they all work together. But there, it's important to keep in mind there's another key force that doesn't have this same interest in NATO membership, and that's the vast majority of the public in this country. It's the people whose quality of life is diminished by a massive diversion of resources and public money from job creation and social programs and education and health towards arms spending and war. It's the people whose sovereignty is reduced and democracy is diminished as an increasing range of foreign and domestic policies are not decided through the public discourse and in the interests of people, but rather behind closed doors and in the interests of a very small select few, among them NATO. And it's the people whose economic, social, and personal security is under constant and deepening threat due to war and militarism. And this is a social force that we need to be reaching out to. This is a social force that can make a big difference. It's um, just a, earlier in the month was the uh, 10th anniversary of those massive demonstrations in 2003 against the uh, invasion of Iraq. And they were, they were so impressive everywhere around the world and they were so impressive in Canada where estimated 500,000 people marched in 80 communities. And <clears throat> that means that virtually everywhere <clears throat> in the country, someone was mobilizing to, uh, to reflect this anti-war sentiment. And it affected all the politicians, for sure. Um, campaigning against NATO is not an easy task. It's a long-term goal, right? I mean, where it's, uh, it's a long struggle. And it, it begs some questions about how do we approach it. And I've been asked uh, a few times, well, is it even possible? Is it even possible to get Canada out of NATO? And I, I'm going to say, well, yes, it is. Um, <clears throat> and I'll give, I'll give an interesting example here. France withdrew from NATO in 1966, and they stayed out until 2009. They didn't, they didn't withdraw completely, but they withdrew. And they withdrew, it was under Charles de Gaulle, who I don't think anybody would call a peace activist, but <clears throat> they withdrew for interesting reasons. It was about an independent foreign policy that de Gaulle and the French government wanted to pursue. It was about, I mean, it had to do with a lot of things, but that was a big part of it. <clears throat> and um, they still stayed uh, members of the alliance, but not militarily. I'm not quite sure how that all functioned, but NATO had to get its, its gear out of France, and France reserved the right to make all kinds of independent foreign policy positions with respect to, for example, East Germany. But who obviously NATO had a different type of foreign policy orientation towards. Um, another example is uh, the Bomark missile. And I don't know if, if you folks know about this, but this was in a nutshell. It was 1963 to 1969. The Bomark was a nuclear warhead missile. And um, the United States had an agreement with Canada to, to deploy them here. They were deployed, uh, I think the deployment began in 63. 
and they were here for about six years. It was enormously unpopular with uh, the public. Uh, lots and lots and lots of pressure, lots of political mo uh, political pressure and public mobilizations. And in 1969, um, they they told the United States, "Get them out, get them out of here." And that chilled Canada-U.S. relations in some ways. I mean, and you know, I don't want to overstate it because obviously it still stayed very close. But that's pretty serious. I mean, in the you figure in in that time, that Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And public pressure forces the government of Canada to say, get them out of here. <clears throat> That's an important victory. And we need to keep that in mind when we talk about this question of NATO and is it pie in the sky or is it doable. The other, <clears throat> the other aspect of that question that's important though is that I think if we just had a campaign that said Canada out of NATO, that's one single objective, that's it. That, of course, that's, that's what we want to see as a Canadian Peace Congress. But if we just positioned a campaign around that goal, it would be really hard to keep it energized and sustained over the long term that it's going to be, right? <clears throat> I mean, I think there's a different way that we can articulate a campaign around NATO. And I think we need to understand that NATO, because uh, as I've said, NATO membership has an impact on a broad range of policy areas, foreign policy, domestic policy, uh, military policy, economic policy. We need to understand that a struggle against NATO membership also has to touch on all those different aspects of people's lives and, and, and our conditions. And so we need to make sure that when we're talking about getting out of NATO, we're also talking about reducing military spending, which at the moment is about is over 25 officially, officially, is over $25 billion a year. Um, in 2008, it was officially $18 billion a year. So just in, in five years, $7 billion more. Officially, that doesn't include things like the, the um, F-35 procurement uh, money or the shipbuilding program that they announced at the same time. I mean, you know, that's all extra. Um, but we need to be talking about that. When we talk about NATO, we need to be talking about nuclear disarmament. When we talk about NATO, we need to be talking about environmental protection. And we mentioned the Arctic and, and the oil sand, the tar sands. Uh, we need to be talking about uh, uh, having just relations with Aboriginal people in the country. So we're not paving over their rights just in the wild march to stay in step with NATO. And I think if we, if we are making those connections in, in an intimate, and, uh, and, and dynamic way, then what we can do is we can have little victories and little efforts that both inform a broader struggle to get Canada out of NATO and sustain that broader struggle, keep it driving forward. That's very, very important that, uh, that we approach things that way. There are anti-NATO campaigns in countries all over the world, and, and some of those campaigns are massive, and some are very small. Um, and they use a variety of different tactics, right? So some are uh, pushing for constitutional amendments that would prevent their countries from being members of a military alliance like NATO. Some are, um, uh, you know, a lot of them are, are based on demonstrations and, and, uh, and rallies. Um, some, some organizations use uh, direct action tactics on things like, uh, around efforts like blocking access to NATO facilities or NATO bases or NATO training camps and things like this. Um, there's a whole range of, of tactics that can be used, and one thing that, you know, could be, th we could think about all of those things in Canada, and we should, but it, one thing that we could add to that from a Canadian point of view is pressuring opposition parties to adopt anti-NATO and, and keep anti-NATO positions. The NDP used to have one. For years they had an anti-NATO position, and then it got quiet, and then um, it was kind of pushed aside by Jack Layton a few years ago. And you know, I don't think that they could have done that. I don't think the NDP could have moved away from that. And this isn't to, to get into a discussion about NDP politics, just to use that as an example. I don't think they could have done that if there'd been a loud voice in the public that said, no, NATO is a problem. Like, don't you dare. You have to keep that position and you have to develop that position so that it plays out in a whole range of policy areas. That's what we need to be looking at doing. Um, so I'll just finish up here by saying uh, 
<clears throat> when I was talking in Ottawa, I um, someone asked, okay, so what, what approach do we take to a campaign? And I came up with this idea. It's a little cheesy. The three O's approach to building a, an anti-NATO campaign. Expose, counterpose, and propose. So expose. We have to expose the realities of NATO and its role in the world. Human, economic, social, and financial costs of its members. We just have to educate people and make sure they're aware of it. <clears throat> we have to counterpose, which means, um, you know, saying, okay, here's the amount of money we can spend on arms, $25 billion a year, and here's social programs that are all being defunded. Let's look at the two side by side and ask the question, is there a better use of our resources? Is there a better orientation of our foreign policy? Um, you know, is there a better way to, to, uh, to make public policy decisions rather than doing them behind closed doors? We need to counterpose and we need to propose. We need to say Canada should get out of NATO and have a new foreign policy that's independent based on peace and international cooperation and solidarity. Because if we're not talking about it, it won't happen. You know, if the one guarantee, I, can, I cannot guarantee that Canada is going to pull out of NATO in my lifetime, but I probably could guarantee that it'll never happen if people don't demand it. <clears throat> Even a small movement of people demanding it, there's an important beginning and that's an important base to build upon and we have to do that. So thanks very much for, uh, for listening to all of that. I hope that we could have a <clears throat> now I look forward to a discussion, and um, uh, hopefully we can look at some of these proposals for how to build a, a campaign, but anything else too. Thanks.